Well, good morning. So I was 25 years old, and I found myself at one of those kind of crossroad moments in life. Uh, I think most of us know what those moments are, where it's like you have to choose one path, but choosing that path means that the other paths that you could choose uh, are not open to you anymore. Um, it's one of those moments uh, where my now wife and I were dating at the time. We had been dating for about three years, and I had to figure out if I was going to want to marry this person or not. And I know for some of us in the room, it's like you met the person, and right away you knew exactly this was the person. And then there's some of us in the room where it's like it, we just, it just takes us a little bit longer. And so my wife will joke with me sometimes. She says, it took her three months to figure out that she wanted to marry me, and it took me three years to figure out. Uh, and, and so th it was just one of those moments where, you know, I was after college. I had spent a year uh, as an intern at a different church, and I had this little gap in time where I could do something with that time. And so I had a couple friends who also had a little gap in time in their life, too. And so the three of us decided to go out uh, to the western part of the U.S. and just spend a month traveling through the mountains and going to national parks and backpacking um, and doing all that kind of stuff. Uh, and it was awesome. We hit up these parks. We did some long backpacking trips. We did some day hiking. Um, it's one of those kind of once-in-a-lifetime sorts of trips. Uh, it didn't cost too much, just being there with friends and living simply. This, this is kind of, if I'm honest, this is like the good life for me. This is like what makes me really happy. Uh, it's emblematic of this like perfect, happy existence. Uh, it's like a literal and a metaphorical mountaintop experience because we were hiking up mountains all the time. Uh, but I think each of us has something like that, right? Like for you, it might not be that, but you could probably imagine what that perfect experience or, or of like being happy looks like. Um, and so while we had this goal of just hanging out and having fun together, I also had this other goal on the back of my mind too, which is that I wanted some time and space to really spend some time trying to hear from God about this whole marriage thing. <laughs> I was like, I, I really want to allow myself some space to really figure out, like, God, do you want me not only to get married, but to get married to this person? Um, and so I had these two different goals going for this trip. And so there was a lot riding on this trip for me. And, and to be honest, I thought I would hear a voice or I would get some sort of a strong sense of something, like one way or the other. You know, and I even thought, like, well, one way or the other, I just want it to be clear. The worst thing is to be in the middle and it, and it just to be this unclear thing. I wanted it to be clear one way or the other. And so I was waiting for that, that, that voice or that message or something, but as the weeks and the days went on and no voice came, I started realizing something, I, that I wasn't going to get a confirmation either way. I wasn't going to get something that just told me what to do but something else also accompanied that experience. I actually felt pretty calm about it. I felt like I could just make a decision. Like I could make a decision and that I could make it what I wanted to make it, that I could make a decision and that there would be peace about it and that I could step into that decision in faith and that everything would be okay. That was kind of what I walked away from it. Um, I was still trying to shake off stuff from my childhood where I thought that a relationship would save me. That, that's really the thing that I grew up with. It's like someday I'll marry that person and I'll be in that relationship and then, you guys, then my life will be perfect. <laughs> Some of us in, the, in this room believe it right, currently or, or we did believe it at some point in time, right? And, and so that was the thing that I felt like God was trying to break me out of. He was like, I'm not just going to give you an answer and tell you do this and then your life will be perfect. I'm, I'm going to keep you in that mystery where you're going to have to learn to trust me in the relationship or out of the re relationship. Either way, you're going to have to learn to trust me. So I, I was starting to see in small ways what was actually true, that whether I'm with someone or not, that was not the thing that was going to give me the happiness that I was looking, looking for. And so I don't know if you've ever experienced this with relationships um, 
or maybe it's something else. You know, for me, money is like useful, but I'm not thinking about money all the time. But for some of us, it's money, right? I mean, money is the thing that means security. It means happiness. It means that we can operate in the world the way that we want to. Um, I have a best friend who is married and he has no kids and he makes a ton of money and he goes on trips and he texts me pictures on his vacations all the time. <laughs> he just texted me one the other day where I was like, look what I'm doing. Isn't this awesome? And, and it kind of, it came from making really wise decisions about money, right? And so for some of us, it might be money. For some of us, it might be power. That's the thing that really we associate happiness with, is if I keep getting promoted or if I have the power that I'm looking for, if I can move up the ladder of life, and then, then I'll be happy. And a lot of times, money and power, they go together. Uh, for some of us, it, it might be influence, right? Not only to be powerful or to have a lot of money, but to be influential, to have people look at us and be like, wow, that's the kind of person that I want to follow. Um, and so what is it, what is that thing for you that you look at and you're like, this is the thing that's going to give me the full life. This is the thing that's going to make me happy. And I want to say that maybe, just, just maybe for some of us, we might even treat our relationship with God in this way. Like if I have the right religious experience or, or if I read the right book, then I'll be close to God. Then I'll be this complete person and then I will be this person that maybe even people look up to as like a spiritual authority. And so we might make that the goal of our lives. I, I want to invite you guys to open up your Bibles to the book of Colossians uh, chapter 1. It's in the New Testament. It's one of Paul's letters. Uh, he wrote it to this small little congregation, this church uh, in the, the ancient city of Colossae. And the reality for this church in this city of Colossae in the ancient world is that in modern day Turkey uh, is that they too faced all kinds of temptations and ideas about what to believe, about how to live, and about what would actually make them happy. What would fill their lives up? What would, would set them free? And so it's into that kind of a context that Paul is writing, and he writes this letter to them. I'm going to start with the first two verses. This is Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Now we need to recognize something that right off the bat, this is one of these classic Paul introductory letter writing. It's the kind of stuff that we take usually about five seconds to read and then we just keep moving on. Uh, Paul is actually making a couple controversial statements that we might not recognize. Yeah, first thing he's saying is that he is an apostle. So just slow down. Remember what apostle is? It's someone who has witnessed the resurrected Jesus. So right off the bat, Paul is saying, I've seen Jesus alive from the dead. Just think about how powerful that statement is. And then remember that that word Christ literally just means king. So he says, I'm an apostle who's seen Christ Jesus. Really what he's saying is, I've seen Jesus alive and he's the true king. We live under this government where there's a different king in charge, but I'm telling you, there's a different king than that one who actually is in charge of things. And that's what Paul is saying. So he's right off the bat in this letter. He's making this kind of confrontational statement to the church where he's, he's almost asking them, who is your allegiance to? Is it going to be to Caesar or is it going to be to King Jesus who I have seen as resurrected? Now, this church in Colossae, we think it could be really, really small. It, it might even be just 10 people. So some of us are involved in neighborhood communities and we have about 10 people in our neighborhood community. Could have been a church like that. Could have been a little bit bigger than that. Could have been 20 or 30, maybe even 50, but probably not, not too much bigger than that. Uh, and as we read this letter, what we're going to learn is that Paul is not the one who planted this church. In fact, Paul did ministry in the town of Ephesus. It's where we get our letter to the Ephesians from. Uh, and he converted this guy named Epaphras. So just go ahead and take a look at verse 7 real quick. It says, he's talking about the gospel. So he says, you learned about the gospel from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. 
So Epaphras is the guy that Paul talked to. And so Paul is almost more of like a grandfather to this church. And so Epaphras is coming to Paul now, Paul who's sitting in a jail cell, looking for some advice from him. Because this little brand new young congregation of people who are following Jesus have this whirlwind of decisions that they need to try to figure out. They're trying to figure out who the true Jesus is. And and they're trying to figure out whether or not they're going to be faithful to the true Jesus. And Paul jumps right in off the bat. And and it comes across kind of plain in English. But the way that I I read this passage is that Paul is is actually being sort of confrontational. Because he jumps in off the bat and he hits them across the face with what's true about Jesus. By saying, I've seen King Jesus resurrected from the grave. And I'm writing to you faithful believers. But the question is, were they faithful? I I think that Paul is saying two things. I think he's affirming them on the one hand. He's saying, yes, I see that you're trying to be faithful. Keep going. But as we read this letter, what's going to become clear, it's actually baked into the letter, is that they're really struggling and they're trying to figure out, should we be faithful? I think this is a community that's almost teetering on the edge. It's teetering on the brink of whether or not to remain faithful because they were hearing all kinds of ideas about what was actually true about God, and they were blending it together with Jesus, or they were tempted to do so. These were ideas about Jesus that seemed really enticing. They were ideas that promised spiritual happiness, but at the cost of the true gospel. And so it's into this context and this culture that Paul writes, and he reminds them, be faithful be faithful. For, for them, the cultural temptations were kind of unique. And we're going to get nerdy here for just a second, all right? I'm going to do this fast so that we don't have anybody falling asleep. Are you ready? Here are the three things that they were tempted to follow. The, the first one, and I know we have at least a couple philosophers in this room, so forgive me right off the bat, you guys. This is going to be really brief, yeah. Uh, the first temptation that they had was a, was a Platonist temptation. And just to put it in a really simple way, Uh, they had the temptation to believe that the world was split up into a physical reality and non-physical reality or spiritual. There's the spiritual realm and the physical realm. And it would say that the spiritual realm was more important, was more pure, was better than the physical realm. So when you blend that in with Jesus, now think about it. Jesus was fully human and fully divine. Well, they were tempted to believe that Jesus was not fully human, that he was just a spiritual being, right? So that's one temptation that they had to deal with. Another temptation that they had that they could believe was what we might call a Gnostic temptation. That sounds really fancy. It's really not all that fancy. It just comes from a word gnosis, which you can, you can almost hear it. It means knowledge, gnosis. So it's, it was an idea, it was a philosophy that said there was secret knowledge that you could have about God and about the world and about spirituality, that if you were able to attain that secret special knowledge, you would be a part of like a spiritual elite. You could be a part of this really great spiritual elite club. You would be better than other people. And I got to say, as weird as these sound, that kind of stuff is still alive and well in the world today. I don't know if, you, if any of you have seen it, but, but pay attention to it because there's parts of Christianity even that will talk about knowing s- secret spiritual things about Jesus, and, and it's usually causing people to want to follow it so that they can become a spiritual elite kind of person. The third temptation was different. There were some Jewish people in the town, and there was, it was a Jewish religious temptation. It was to say, you take the Jewish dietary laws and the customs and those kinds of things, and if you follow those things, then you will get closer to God. So now, let's blend it all together. Are you ready? You put it into the blender. You can make a cocktail out of these things, and you put Jesus right in the middle, and you have these three very, very different ideas about God, and you try to get Jesus right into the middle of it, and you try to make that work, And you try to call that the good news, the gospel message. But it wasn't the true gospel message at all. And you guys, this is why I'm really excited. I'm actually very excited to go through Colossians this summer with you. Because we live in a world that doesn't try to blend three ideas together. 
We live in a world that tries to blend dozens and dozens of ideas that are all contradictory or coming from different standpoints about who Jesus is or who God is or how to attain higher forms of spirituality or spiritual consciousness. I mean, this is our culture. And Paul is speaking to them, but he's speaking to you as well. He's speaking to us. And that's why I'm really excited because Paul's speaking into our context and he's saying, slow down, stop. Be faithful to who Jesus actually is. You're trying to live this happy, complete life. You're trying to live this full life, but you have to do it within the reality of the true Jesus, of who he really is. Because the motivation, if we, if we separate ourselves from the true Jesus, our motivation will be culturally motivated. Our cultural temptation will fall into it, and it's this desire to live a full life but to live it on our own terms. And that could look different for each and every one of us. It's the desire to pursue happiness on our own terms, apart from Jesus. And Paul knows that it will never work because that's not how life works. Happiness or fullness on its own terms can be really, really fickle. It actually reminds me of when I was, I think it was about seven or eight. Now, Santa would bring me presents, but my parents would also bring me a present every single year uh, around Christmas time. And I knew which gift my parents were getting me that year. And you'll see a picture of it up here. I think this was the actual game that, it, that I got. Let's see. Yeah, I think it was Aladdin. Do, you, do any of you guys remember this? Any of you who are about my age remember like the early 90s? This, I think this might have been like even before a Game Boy and stuff. But you'd get these little video games or like 2D video games. And, you know, battery powered. And they could make an eight-hour trip feel like a one-hour trip because you'd just be in the back of the car playing Aladdin. Um, and, and so I knew I was getting this game. And so a couple days before Christmas, I asked my parents if I could get that gift early. And I keep begging them. I'd be like, could I, can I please open it? I don't want to wait till Christmas morning. And we were at my grandparents, and all the cousins were there for a few days. And so finally, my parents, they said, yes, you can open it a day early. And so I opened it a day early, and I was playing my game, and I was so happy. I, I was playing it all Christmas Eve. But then Christmas morning came, and everybody was opening their gift, and I didn't have a gift to open. And I, I remember this. I can remember it so clearly, sitting behind my grandparents' couch up, up against the wall, crying while I'm playing the game, <laughs> you know? Like... The thing is, is that I got exactly what I wanted. I got it on my own timeline, on my own schedule, and it, it ultimately made me absolutely miserable. And, and sometimes I think, we think we know what will make us happy, but we actually don't. Have you ever gotten what you really, really wanted to get, and it made you miserable at, in the end? It, it can happen for some of us. Because this pursuit of fullness, apart from Jesus, is fickle. It depends on me understanding what it means to be full. Me understanding what's going to make my life happy. And for as, I'm hopefully getting better at that as I get older, but I just, I have such a way of deceiving myself, of thinking that I know when I don't actually know. And this gospel message of Jesus is empowering. Because instead of hoping on the things that I can see, and the things that I want, it causes us to hope in him, it, to, to hope in him. He's the fullness of life, to receive that fullness of life that God intends for us, to receive it through the gospel of Jesus, because it's not dependent upon our circumstances at all, and that's what makes it so powerful. Paul puts it this way in verses 3 and 4. He says, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all of God's people. So Paul shows us first and foremost what this true gospel looks like. It's a message that's not based on getting ahead in life. In fact, it's based on laying down your life for others. And so the first thing I want to say about the, the gospel here in this passage, that, that it causes us to be thankful in suffering. Now, it talks about Paul saying that he's thankful for them whenever he prays for them. And you might look at the passage, you might say, Nate, he doesn't mention suffering at all. What are you talking about? Well, just pause for a second. Remember where Paul is writing from. 
Paul is writing from a jail cell. He's sitting in a jail cell and he's thankful. He's there because of his faithfulness to the gospel message of Jesus. I mean, he is there because he witnessed the resurrected Jesus and he wouldn't back down from that. And people didn't like that he wouldn't back down. And so he's in jail because of the message and he's in jail and he says that he's thankful for these people. He's, he's got this spirit of thankfulness even sitting in a jail. He's, thankfulness even in his, he's thankful even in his suffering. Uh, now, it would be really hard for us to be in a jail cell and be thankful. I mean, it would, be, it would be hard for me to be thankful for almost anything. And yet, it's possible. It's possible because of where his hope was. His hope and his joy were not associated with his freedom. Paul's hope and joy had nothing to do with being physically free or not. I, he, he probably would have loved to be free if he had the choice, but it wasn't the end all be all because his hope was located somewhere different. And we're going to learn where it was located, but it had nothing to do with his physical freedom. It, it was located with Jesus somewhere that nobody could touch. Nobody could take it away from him. You know, it reminds me of the way that sometimes we have to correct our kids. For any of you who have kids, I have two kids, uh, two boys, an eight-year-old and a six-year-old, and they're just classic boys, right? They're best friends. They do everything together. They also yell at each other and hit each other and get under each other's skin all the time. And so sometimes we have to use, you know, corrective measures. We have to take something away or, or separate them so that they can come back when they're ready to treat each other with kindness and respect, all of that. Do I sound like a parent? Yes. Um, and so pretty quickly you start to learn that certain ways of, of correcting your kid's behavior work better for certain kids and not for the other one, right? So at first we used to, with our older kid, we would tell him, go, go to your room, like the door's open, you're not locked in there. You're, you, like whenever you're ready to come out and re-engage with everybody else, come on out. You, like, you stay in there as long as you need to. Well, he would stay in there, and he would go up to his bed, and he would read books for hours. And he was happy as a clam. I mean, this is like the best case scenario. Like, you're trying to punish me by putting me in my room alone with my books, and that is my favorite thing to do. So we learned pretty quickly not to do that. But what we learned is that he loves to save up money from his allowances um, to get the toys and things that he, he's putting, you know, he's got a plan for these toys that he wants to get. And so the better thing to do with him would be to say, you know what, Titus, if you're not ready to treat your brother this way, it's going to cost you. Like, it's going to cost you at your actual money. You're going to lose out on your allowance. And all of a sudden, that starts to work because his hope is in that. His hope is in that money that, that you're threatening to take away. And so if you could figure out what somebody's hope is in and threaten it, it's powerful. You know, that, that could really do a lot. But for Paul, he's in a jail cell and he's thankful. Why? How could he be thankful in a jail cell? Because the gospel displaces our hope in the things of this world and reorients it to the person of Jesus. As you let the gospel penetrate into your life, little by little, day by day, it displaces the things that you thought you hoped in. And it puts it onto Jesus. It puts your hope on to Jesus. And that's why he's thankful. That's why he can be thankful. It's actually why he's not surprised by the situation, but rather he understands. This is just a part of what living out the gospel in our world looks like. It causes us to be thankful in the midst of suffering because our value, our hope, our faith, our love, it doesn't come from the stuff that I can see and touch anymore. I mean, that stuff is good too, but my hope is somewhere else completely. Which is why he says this in verses 5 and 6. He says, The faith and love that spring up from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. Now just hear those words again. Faith and love that springs up from hope that's for you in heaven and about which you've already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. We've heard about this faith and this love of yours that springs up from hope. So not only does the gospel make us thankful in suffering, not only does it make us thankful and loving and faith-filled, but it does these things because our lives are now centered on hope. 
Now, if you're familiar with the New Testament, uh, you, you might recognize he said three words that should just kind of like put a light bulb in your head. He said faith, hope, and love, right? He says that faith and love spring up from hope. Now, those three words pop up elsewhere in some of Paul's writings, not least of which is 1 Corinthians 13, right? His famous um, poem on spiritual gifts, where he talks about these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So he really focuses in on the greatness of love in that passage. Well, here he's going to focus on something else. He's going to focus in on hope. I don't think there's a contradiction here, but it's really unique to hear how he puts this. He, he uses this language of faith and love springing up from hope. It, it almost gives me the picture. How many of you are gardeners in this room? I know I've mentioned gardening a lot. Yes, I love, I love being around gardeners because we're all so polite about raising our hands. We're not like, oh, I'm a gardener. We're all very quiet and peaceful people. We're like, I'm a gardener right here. In the springtime, and for any of you who go on walks in the springtime, late March, April, you walk around the neighborhood, and I'm always on the lookout for things that are springing up. And like this year, the plants sprung up really late around my house, and it was really frustrating. Uh, but I'm always on the lookout for things that are springing up. And it reminds me of that language. Now, this is a plant of ours. You should have seen it two months ago. This is sage. Um... It was beautiful when we bought it. We bought it from a nursery. And then we were like getting garden beds ready and we were doing all kinds of stuff. And then a month later we were like, oh yeah, we have that sage plant that's dead apparently. Because it looked like it was dried out. You know, it was not in good shape. And so we took the sage plant, we put it into this pot. I put just the best soil in it and I gave it a lot of water and gave it everything that it needed. And it did not take long at all. I mean, within a day or two, it had totally sprung up it was back to life again. And, and this is some, sometimes how our life can look. You put it in the right soil, and it starts to spring up. In fact, I want you to think, have you ever been in a situation where you thought you were the problem, or you thought you had a problem, but you, you started to realize that it was actually just the environment that you were in that was causing you to act or to think in a particular way? Uh, so, so maybe you're around a lot of people who are all speaking really negatively. you got a lot of negative voices in your life, and all of a sudden, you're thinking negatively, and you're talking negatively, and you just find that you're angry all the time. But it, you remove yourself from that situation, and you start getting yourself around people who don't talk like that, people who are positive, people who are encouraging, and all of a sudden, you start becoming this encouraging person. You, you realize that it was actually the environment that I was in that mattered. Or, or maybe it was because you have a lot of stress in a particular job and you just become this kind of grumpy, stressful person who's not happy with their life. And eventually somebody who's close to you says, get a different job. <laughs> and you get a different job and all of a sudden, oh, I'm not a grumpy, crabby, stressful person. I can actually be happy and relax. And, and it was all because of the environment that you were in. Or, or maybe it's just that you allow someone close to you in your life who's just taking advantage of you in some way, and, and it's really ruining things in your life. And, it, and when you can finally set some healthy boundaries, all of a sudden your life kind of springs up. Things kind of change for the better. It's amazing how quickly that can happen when we realize the actual source of the problems in our life. Th then we're able to put ourselves into a different kind of environment and our life starts to spring up. It starts to rebound. And, and I think so often as Christians, we look at, at um, the fruit of the Spirit. We're like, I want to be more loving. I want to be more hopeful. I want to have more peace. And we look at those things. And, and those things are good things to focus on. But Paul is saying, listen, faith and love is going to spring up in your life. It's going to naturally spring up if you put it in an environment of hope. You need hope for faith and love to spring up. Love is not possible without hope. True gospel-shaped hope is the healthy soil out of which grows faith and love. And hope, here in this passage and elsewhere in the New Testament, is this Greek word that uh, it's el peace, and all it means is to anticipate, and to anticipate usually with pleasure. It's to look to the future and to be like, I can't wait for that. I can't wait for that. 
So, so often we tell each other, like, be loving. You should be a more peaceful person. You should, you should be a person who does these things better. And, and really what we should start with sometimes is where are you putting your hope? Because that's going to fuel everything. So where is your hope? Is it in the gospel? That's why you should be hopeful. This Jesus-centered, hope-filled gospel, it tells us not only are you forgiven by the cross, by Jesus' life poured out for you, but you should be hopeful because you know that he still lives. You recognize Paul saying that. He's saying, I witness the resurrected Christ. If you have a Bible in your hands, you have the testimonies of dozens of people who saw Jesus alive from the dead. These are people who ate with him after he resurrected. These are people who laughed with him. These are people who celebrated with him. They had intimate conversations with a resurrected Jesus. And they saw him ascend to the Father, and they know that he's there. And that should fill your heart with hope. If you have your hope in him, Nothing can take that away from you, even if you're in a jail cell, even if you're in the worst situations. And so what happens when your hope becomes in Jesus in this good news of the gospel? Paul says it next. He says it bears fruit. You see, this plant is not here just to exist on its own, right? In fact, it's sage, so if I rub it, it smells awesome, right? It's a culinary herb. It's got all of these purposes. If you remember the children's songs that some of us used to sing, what are we supposed to not do? We're we're supposed to not hide it under a bushel. No, we're supposed to let it shine. There's something supposed to happen with our lives once once we become a Jesus follower. But there's this temptation sometimes to just hide what Jesus is doing. But he says, to live in hope, to embrace faith and love and follow Jesus means that you will bear fruit. Here's what it says in verse 6. It says, In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day that you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You see, some of us, maybe we've been following Jesus for so long that we kind of forget what it's like to live a life with misplaced hope. And I think even for us Christians, we can so often live life with misplaced hope. And and here's what that can look like. It can look like life is like a roller coaster. Like there's a lot of ups and downs to life. And the ups, those are things that we look at in our life and we're so excited about. I'm going on this trip next month with all my best friends and I am so excited about that. And that's where my hope is right now. Um, If you could go to the next slide. Yeah, there we go. Awesome. Like, those are the things. But then we look at the down parts of our lives and, and we try to avoid those parts and we try not to experience the really low parts of life. And so what we might do is we might try to self-medicate or we might distract ourselves just so I don't have to experience it or we might just fill our time with so much entertainment and leisure um, just to get ourselves through these low parts of life and this is how our life can look like most of the time but the gospel of Jesus flips all of that around. It flips that around. The good news about Jesus is that even your best days are not your best days. There's more to come. There's more to come than even your best days. Um, He says that that no eye has seen or ear has heard what Jesus has in store for those who love them. And, And it also takes those difficult moments of your life and it actually starts to infuse them with hope, um, which is, is hard to believe, but that's what can happen in the lowest moments of our life is that they start to get infused with hope. Uh, a few years ago, I came across this, this thing um, called hope molecules. I, I know we have some doctors in the room, so does anybody, has anybody heard of these before? They're called myokines, and they are proteins that live in our muscles. But that word, hope molecules really caught my attention because what these things do, these hope molecules, we have over 600 of them living inside of every muscle in our body and they are released into your body anytime you're contracting your muscles. So walking, running, lifting weights, exercising, any of that kind of stuff releases these hope molecules into your body. So the the, the funny thing is they, they are released under stress. They're released when you would think you'd like at the time when I would think, boy, why are they being released at that moment? 
but they're actually released to fix all of the problems in your body. I know I'm kind of just glancing over this really lightly, but what they do, they have the ability to help all of your vital organs, to help your pancreas, your liver, your entire immune system is activated with these hope molecules when you use your muscles. Um, they, they can actually attack cancerous tumors in your body. They have an impact on your gut microbiome. They improve your bone density. They have a massive help to brain health. There's some doctors who research this now that say that exercise should be prescribed for the 26 most common diseases in America because these hope molecules are that powerful. And the, un the incredible thing about them is they're released when you're under the most amount of stress and pressure physically. And that's the way God created your body. Isn't that amazing? Now think about it with your spiritual life, though. If your bodies operate that way, think about the way that hope arises in your life sometimes at the lowest moments, in the most unlikely places. Do you believe that Jesus is there with you? Do you believe it when life is at your darkest, that Jesus is there? I want to bring your attention to the cross. To the cross, when life was at its darkest for Jesus, what did he say? He said, Father, why have you forsaken me? Jesus experienced this hopelessness so that we would never have to experience hopelessness alone. Ever again, the author of hope experienced deep, dark hopelessness on the cross for each and every one of us, and that is the best news. That is such good news. And Paul says it's bearing fruit. It's bearing fruit in your life. It's bearing fruit in the people all around you. And so the question is, it's not, do you have hope? The question is, where is your hope? Or in whom is your hope? Because we all hope in something. We all put our trust in someone or something and Paul wants to break us out of the cycle of the ups and downs of life, and I'm happy when it's up, and I'm sad when it's down, and he wants to get us to see beyond that and to see that our hope exists above and beyond any of those circumstances. And that's part of what this letter to the Colossians is all about. It's all about getting us to live the full life, but the full life on Jesus' terms, not on our own terms. And so today, the, the question we might want to ask ourselves right now, or maybe it's later today, you might want to take some time and journal or, or go on a walk and think about it, is just, what have I placed my hope in? I think it's easy to, as a Christian just to say, well, Jesus. But no, really, if, if something was, ta was taken away from you, if you lost all your money, how would you be? Would, would you actually be okay? Now, don't feel bad if you would be. I would not be okay. It would take me some time like, this is where I'm growing, right? Seriously. Like, I don't know if I would be okay if I lost possessions or money or any of that stuff. But there's something Paul tapped into sitting in a jail cell where he's like, this is not what my hope was in anyways. And for us as followers of Jesus, just think of how powerful that makes you to follow Jesus. Nobody can ever take Jesus away from you. And so today, think about it. Is my hope in Jesus? And we want to make it more and more so. So whatever it is for each of us, whatever it is that we place our hope in, here's the good news. Wherever you're at, you can start walking towards hope more right now. You can start talking to Jesus more on a daily basis and saying, you know what? If I'm honest, I don't hope in you to the extent that I should. If I'm honest, I want you to change me more. And we don't have to feel ashamed or bad about that. You're just a human. Join the club. It's okay. But let's be honest with ourselves and with God. So don't settle for merely being happy. Happy is good. I like being happy. But happy is just a cheap imitation of hopeful. So let's begin our journey today of allowing God, allowing him to displace this stuff that we hope in so that we can actually hope in him more. Would you pray with me? God, if I'm honest, um, I don't hope in you to the extent that I should, but I want to more. And Lord, um, my prayer for myself and my prayer for every person in this room is that you would teach us this week what it looks like to place our hope in you, our trust in you, 
And I pray that you would somehow, Lord, make us excited about that. I pray that you would somehow shake us and rattle, rattle us to the extent so that we can experience your life and your love and we can learn to trust you more. God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you that we can have eternal life in the future and we can have abundant life right now. God, I pray that you would teach us to walk with you more day by day, that our lives would look like Jesus, that the world would see it, that we would bear fruit because of the work that you're doing in our lives. We thank you for all these things. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.